Greetings, salutations, and welcome. Due to my startling ineptitude and inexperience with editing, this video ended up being way longer than I thought it would be. So for convenience, I decided to divide it up into parts, a list of which I will put in the description. I have tried to edit it down as much as possible. I'm rather bad about wandering off on tangents, as it turns out. But as my main aim with this was to try and encourage certain people to think differently about the subject, I really felt I should qualify, justify and contextualise everything I said as much as possible. But so as not to drag this out anymore, let's jump straight in with the introduction. So today I'm going to be taking a look at a video by a YouTuber called 42. I don't remember where I first heard of 42's channel, but as soon as I did, I knew I had to look him up. You see, I am a huge fan of Douglas Adams. Growing up as a teenager, I read and reread his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books more times than I can remember. I love the TV series and used to listen to the radio plays again and again. Douglas Adams was not only an extremely funny and imaginative writer, but also had a way of making quite profound observations about life, our society and the human condition in a wonderfully whimsical and accessible manner. Imagine therefore my disappointment to discover that in appropriating the identity of 42, Deep Thought's answer to the great question of life, the universe and everything, Mr. 42 seems to have the answers to nothing possessing none of Douglas Adams' insight or intelligence. In fact, he is almost the antithesis of everything that Douglas Adams is great for. 42 is shallow and lacking in any basic understanding about people and society. Although I admit it's a little irrational, I take it quite personally that he appropriates something I love dearly and then using that identity shares such unresearched, incorrect, poorly thought out or straight up dishonest ideas. So for that reason, I wanted to cover one of his videos, show all the ways in which he is wrong, and set the record straight. And although I cannot speak for the man, from what his writing suggests about his outlook on life, I genuinely think that Douglas Adams would find many of Thoughty's beliefs and claims deeply abhorrent. The reason I chose this particular video is because Thoughty is talking about a topic I have been interested in tackling for a while now, the subject of toxic masculinity. Now it cannot have escaped most people's notice, but we are currently living in politically very divided times. In recent years, a huge rift has developed between the long-standing right-wing and left-wing spectrums of political thought. As a result of this division, there are now many issues or topics which are rarely discussed separately on their individual merits, but rather have been sucked up and turned into battlegrounds for this all-encompassing partisan culture war. A phenomenon which sadly seems to benefit no one, and only serves to make everyone a little stupider for being forced to engage with it. It's now assumed that you cannot be a pro-choice conservative, or you cannot be a pro-gun liberal, which are ridiculous limitations to impose upon the freedom of individual thought when you actually think about it. And one of the many subjects which has fallen victim to the left-right struggle is that of women's rights and feminism. Feminism and women's rights is today considered to be a territory exclusively for liberals and the left. Which on the surface doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It's not as if there aren't any female conservatives out there. But the rationale for this seems to be that those on the right supported what we would call first and second wave feminism, essentially the right to vote and the right to education and a career, but now we have reached third wave feminism, which is nothing but some ridiculous Marxist notion of absolute perfect gender blind equality where women are socially identical to men in every respect, even if that equality doesn't arise or occur naturally and needs to be instigated and maintained by force. Now this is obviously a massively reductive viewpoint which treats modern feminists as some kind of hive minded borg. But in spite of that, many on the right will now cite some version of this rationale and use it to entirely dismiss the notion of modern feminism. So now feminism is seen as something that only liberals are really preoccupied with. And one of the things that these liberal feminists seem to like to talk about a lot recently is how our society is fundamentally a patriarchy. Now personally, I don't see this in itself as a controversial statement. A patriarchy is simply a society where men hold the majority of power and control. And I don't think anyone would deny that men have always played a far more prominent role in shaping our society and wielding most of the political, economic and social power. 
The controversy seems to come from disagreements over to what extent patriarchal control has been, and maybe still is, oppressive to women. Some would argue that it may have been oppressive in the past, but now that women can vote, work and hold political office, the oppression is officially ended and there are no more problems. To which others would counter that the facts on the ground are that women still have much less political power than men, and much, much, much less economic power, and this is in itself oppressive. But I'm not here to arbitrate that. What is important to note, however, is how criticisms of the patriarchy tend to get sucked up and absorbed into part of another liberal concern or talking point, and that is our society's history of conquest, imperialism, and institutions such as slavery. Again, some would say, why are you so obsessed about assigning blame for things that happened decades or centuries ago? These things are in the past, and we have since built an extremely prosperous, just and fair society that treats everyone equally under the law. Why not concentrate on the good we've done, rather than always needlessly focusing on the bad? To which one might reply, it's not about assigning blame, but coming to terms with the fact that the prosperous society we enjoy came, at least partly, at the expense and suffering of others. And that not only is trying to atone for our sins and make amends, something which we widely consider to be markers of a wise, honourable and just society, but that we are also our parents' legacy, our parents' our grandparents' legacy, and our grandparents' our great-grandparents' legacy. So whilst, yes, many of these things did happen in the past, their effects rippled down through the generations and still have a tangible impact on the lives of many people today. But what we end up with is these feminist liberal SJWs talking about how, with our superior resources and technology, white Europeans spread out across the globe, seizing land and resources and killing, subjugating or enslaving any peoples unable to resist us and also talking about how our society is a patriarchy dominated and controlled by men. So therefore, it is the white man who is responsible for all of these bad evil things, and it is the white man who should check his privilege, look at himself in the mirror, and atone for his sins. This has, perhaps understandably, left some white men feeling personally attacked and persecuted blamed for events over which they have no influence or control, and constantly being told they benefit from special social privileges denied to others, despite the fact that many of them are unable to identify much tangible privilege in their own lives. These men feel like they're being vilified simply for being born a certain way, and they feel they're being denied the right to take pride in what they see as their own identity and socio-cultural heritage. Now I will point out briefly that I too am a European cis white hetero male, I too am at the very top of the intersectional oppression parade, and quite simply, I don't feel personally attacked or blamed for the sins of white men as a whole, especially as I am not the child of the economic aristocracy or heir to a vast fortune. But then I am a little older, and I grew up, forge my own personal identity and learn to be happy with myself long before these ideas became an integral part of the wider social narrative. Also simply being around a bit longer means I've had more time to learn more things, meet more people and gain more perspective on the issues. But had I been born and grown up in today's world, I don't know if I would possess the necessary information and context to be able to interpret and understand these issues with the same clarity as I do now. I don't know how the criticisms often levelled at white men as a whole would have affected my own sense of individual identity growing up, and how I would have reacted to hearing these criticisms. Either way, the result is that in recent years we have seen the emergence of a group of almost exclusively white men who call themselves men's rights activists, with the anti-patriarchal, anti-colonialist concerns now being something almost exclusively associated with the left, the movement of men's rights activists is now pretty much firmly entrenched with the politics of the right. Many men's rights activists, or MRAs, are Trump supporters, while some also identify as being part of other reactionary subcultures, such as incels, the outright, and so on. So the sides have been chosen, the battle lines have been drawn, and the war has begun. And into the midst of all this commotion and chaos stumbles an innocent newborn term, toxic masculinity. Well, actually, toxic masculinity isn't such a new term, as we shall see later, but it has only really become relevant in recent years. Either way, it is the predominantly feminist liberal SJWs who now use the term, 
those same feminist SJWs who are already demonising and blaming white men for all of society's ills and problems. And this is clearly just another strategy or excuse to attack and vilify white men and hold them responsible for all of the evil in our world. Or is it? Well, no, it isn't. And that is the reason for me making this video. It seems pretty clear that many MRAs reject the idea of toxic masculinity simply because of how it fits into the context of this wider left-right cultural war. It's an idea proposed by feminists and SJWs who only want to bring the white man down. So obviously it's just another weapon in their arsenal, one that should be sabotaged and destroyed. However, this fundamental conviction that the concept of toxic masculinity was invented solely for the purpose of undermining and disempowering men is flawed. And I say this with total and absolute sincere conviction. I absolutely 100% believe that if men's rights activists actually genuinely care about the welfare and happiness of all men in our society, if the welfare of men is more important to them than singling out and simply supporting their side in the culture war, then they desperately need to understand and embrace the idea of toxic masculinity. I think this is definitely a case where MRAs and those on the right are dismissing a message and refusing to hear its content simply because they don't like the messenger. So basically I have two goals with this video. The first is to look at 42's video on toxic masculinity, which I think is fairly representative of how many understand the subject, and show all of the mistakes, misinterpretations and factual inaccuracies present in his arguments and understanding of the subject. The second goal is to take what Thorty says and use that as a base to hopefully present a definition of toxic masculinity that makes more sense to MRAs and that they can get on board with. I single out MRAs simply because they claim to have at the core of their beliefs a desire to look after and protect the interests of men, to ensure their social welfare and well-being. And if this is genuinely your goal, then understanding toxic masculinity is a vital component in helping to ensure that well-being. However, this video is also aimed at anyone who subscribes to Thorty's perspective on this topic. Because, quite simply, he is wrong. When you dissect his arguments and look at what he says in detail, you'll find it's nothing but smoke and mirrors. Convincing, well-presented smoke and mirrors without a doubt, but smoke and mirrors all the same. There is no substantive base or foundation underlying anything he says. So let's jump in right at the start and look at Thorty's introduction to the subject of toxic masculinity. Are you one of five and ten Caucasians that suffers from an embarrassing and debilitating genetic affliction? Can you not leave the house without hitting or raping a woman? Unable to resist the urge to belittle, shame and sexually harass your female colleagues at work? Did you spend your childhood beating the shit out of your friends at barbecues? Do you still spend your social gatherings revealing your spectacular abs and whipping out your member to compare? Then, I'm afraid, what you have feared is true. You suffer from a horrific disease. Maleness. Don't worry, my disgusting hairy friend. There is a cure. Anti-man. Proven to reduce your testosterone and eradicate your masculinity within 30 days or your money back. So what's going on here? Well clearly Thorty is trying to show how absurd he believes the idea of toxic masculinity is by talking to a supposed singular male viewer and asking that viewer how often they engage in the types of behaviour he most closely associates with toxic masculinity. Things such as rape, violence, abuse etc. Because after all, the overwhelming majority of individual men, especially the ones watching his video, are not likely to be literal rapists or physically especially violent. But in presenting things this way, Thorty is essentially making two important mistakes. The first mistake is a common one that many people often make, and that is to conflate or confuse the individual with the group. An individual and a collection of individuals are two fundamentally different things, in the same way that a grain of sand and a beach are two fundamentally different things. A grain of sand possesses none of the qualities or characteristics of a beach. So 32 is singling out a hypothetical individual man and applying criticisms made about toxic masculinity as a collective social problem to that one man in an attempt to show how absurd they are. 
but no, Thorty. What is absurd is your attempt to try and force statements made about groups to apply to a lone, solitary individual. Now, stupid as this first mistake is, however, it's Thorty's second mistake which is more significant and seems to be why he so completely misunderstands toxic masculinity as a concept. When Thorty hears the term toxic masculinity, what it seems he is actually hearing is masculinity is toxic. And because he seems to think that masculinity is biologically inherent to all men, he is therefore arriving at the conclusion that people are saying men are toxic. But this is also clearly false reasoning. The concept of masculinity is simply not the same thing as the group of people that we identify as being men. Just like the grain of sand and the beach, masculinity and men are two fundamentally different things, and statements about one are not necessarily valid for the other. Masculinity is an idea, a social construct. Prior to humans developing language and reason, masculinity simply did not exist. So Thorty's intro is nonsense, because not only is he failing to understand that saying masculinity is toxic is a completely different thing to saying that men are toxic, but is then going one step further and trying to apply everything to a single individual man. So of course toxic masculinity will sound absurd, not because it necessarily is absurd, but because Thorty is framing it in a completely absurd manner. Did you also notice something else rather revealing right at the start? Are you one of five and ten Caucasians that suffers from an embarrassing and debilitating genetic affliction? Are you one of five and ten Caucasians that suffer? You notice how he says Caucasian here? Are you a white male? What does being white have to do with either masculinity in general or toxic masculinity as a subject? There are men of all colours and ethnic origins. The addition of this one word here perfectly illustrates the problem which I alluded to during the introduction. The fact that Thorty conflates and is unable to separate the concept of toxic masculinity from other separate issues in the larger left-right culture war. Thorty thinks feminist liberal SJWs are trying to demonise the white man, and therefore thinks that toxic masculinity is just another cog in that wheel. But it isn't. Toxic masculinity isn't only restricted to white males, it isn't concerned with race at all. For example, black community and culture comes under attack sometimes for having quite toxic and misogynistic attitudes as well. And I think many would probably also agree that Muslim cultures can often be plagued by toxic masculine attitudes and behaviours. Thorty here is revealing his deeply prejudiced and partisan understanding of toxic masculinity. And rather than trying to make sense of it as its own separate issue, he confuses and conflates it with other completely separate social issues and ideas. And can I just add one little subjective aesthetic observation here as well? I don't usually like ad hominems, as it's the arguments and ideas which should be up for debate, not the merits of the advocate. However, this one I found rather funny. What's going on here? If you're going to make a video espousing the virtues of traditional hegemonic masculinity and making a case for how society needs strong masculine men who we should be proud of and not subject to shaming, why would you do that while sporting this shameful little prepubescent bum fluff monstrosity right here? This, I fear, does not project masculinity. Thought he would look more masculine if he'd just shaven it off. This doesn't invalidate his arguments, of course, I just found it rather ironic. But anyway, having established that Thorty's perspective on this topic is seriously flawed just from the way he presents the introduction to the subject, let's get on to the meat of the actual topic and see how he tries to defend and justify what he believes to be true. This is the message that a growing number of gender activists and corporations that wish to adopt a virtuous facade, most recently Gillette, would have us believe. But what's the reality here? Based on social norms that have been developed over thousands of years, underpinned by biology and using empirical evidence, I seek to rationalise masculinity and answer an important question. Is being masculine bad for society. Now I know we haven't got that far, but I really need to point one or two things out before we go any further. You notice how Thorty Two says this? And using empirical evidence, I seek... Thorty Two says he is going to be using empirical evidence. He doesn't. 
During this entire 18 and a half minute video, Thorty does not cite a single source. No articles, no books, no scientists, no research papers, not even a Wikipedia page. He does at one point throw a few stats on the screen from a variety of disparate sources and countries, some of which are over 10 years old, but without providing the slightest context to any of the data he shows. But I shall cover this in more detail later, as one of the claims he makes about the data is so very egregious and completely and utterly dishonest. But those few random stats is literally the only empirical evidence he provides in the entire video. Also, his last question here is very telling. Is being masculine bad for society? Is being masculine bad for society? Well, once again, Thorty, another fundamental misunderstanding here. Nobody is claiming that being masculine is necessarily bad for society. That's not what people who talk about toxic masculinity are saying in the slightest. I shall cover this more fully later when I hopefully give a better explanation of toxic masculinity and try to sum up all of Thorty's misunderstandings and confusions. But suffice to say for now that toxic masculinity has little or nothing really to do with whether being a manly man is a good or bad thing for society. So in relation to the toxic masculinity discussion, Thorty's important question here is pretty much irrelevant. A good start would be finding out what is masculinity anyway. It is entirely distinct from an individual's biological sex. Sure, masculine traits stem from a person's sex. But if we're getting technical, then masculinity itself is a social construct that describes a set of traits innately present in most men. The same traits, however, can often be found in women, not always and often to lesser extremes. The traits of masculinity can also differ slightly between world cultures, but the core traits that define a masculine man are universally consistent. What are these traits? Stoicism, resilience, strength, courage, independence, and assertiveness. Now before we all judge men for being too assertive, occasionally resorting to violence, or too stoic for not displaying emotion, it's important to understand where these traits actually come from. The traits themselves are not social constructs. Men don't become masculine just because we tell them that crying is for girls and man up. Masculinity in men may be enhanced or even enforced by certain cultures, by social pressures, but make no mistake, masculine traits originate from our biology constructed over a period of 200,000 years. Now there is a lot to unpack here. Thorty is basically saying that although masculinity is a social construct, it's a social construct which is entirely based upon intrinsic and inescapable biological truths, which he does by claiming certain traits are universal and present in all men, although he acknowledges that women can also possess these traits. Now some may already see how his argument is already a little self-defeating. Why would we call something a social construct if it is entirely dictated and controlled by biology? If someone is, say, particularly athletic and their physique and biology well adapted for sport, we wouldn't consider their athleticism to be a social construct. We don't consider bad eyesight or autism to be social constructs. They are things which arise from biology. But let's look at Thorty's list again. Stoicism, resilience, strength, courage, independence, and assertiveness. Stoicism, resilience, courage, strength, independence, and assertiveness. And remember Thorty says the following about these. The core traits that define a masculine man are universally consistent. Now this is a vital and pivotal claim he is making here. He is saying these fundamental traits are present in all men and in all definitions of masculinity across all races and cultures, that all societies value the same masculine traits. Now what evidence does he provide for this pivotal claim? Well, like I said before, none whatsoever. Not one study, analysis or article. Even though this is a very significant claim he is making here which is vital to his argument. So is he correct? Well, no, not really, 
certainly not in the way he is presenting it here. Studies indicate quite widely varying attitudes to many of these things. For example, where Thorty cites independence as being inherent to men everywhere, in Asian cultures such as Japan and China, studies indicate that for men, conformity to the social order and their role in society is valued over individual independence. The truth is there is a fair degree of cultural variation globally concerning specific aspects of masculine identity. Now, I am not claiming for a second that there is no connection between male biology and certain aspects of what we come to think of as masculinity and the social roles that men adopt. But the connection is much more vague and much less defined than thought he is suggesting here, and cannot possibly result in such a rigid set of precise, and in some cases complex, behavioural traits like the ones on his list. Think about independence again. Now, not only do social studies show that independence is not considered a universal masculine trait across all cultures, but there is also a very strong evolutionary and anthropological argument as to why independence is very unlikely to be connected to or rooted in biology. Human beings, by our very nature, are a pack or herd animal. Our survival has always been dependent upon our tendency to live together in groups and cooperate as a means of strength. If human men really did have some biological imperative that pushed them to being independent, we would probably never have survived and evolved. We have survived because our natural tendency and loyalty towards the group or tribe was stronger than our desire for independence. Stoicism I find interesting as I think it's one of these myths that many would like to believe is true, especially of themselves probably, but is rarely reflected by reality. Are these men being stoic? It seems our attitudes are rather confused when it comes to Stoicism and depend a lot on context, which makes it very unlikely to be connected to biological imperatives. It seems when we talk about Stoicism, we are talking about the fact that men are not supposed to show one specific emotion, sadness. Men shouldn't cry. And even that one seems rather contextual. Outwardly, men can be angry, aggressive, jubilatory, passionate, overjoyed, but not sad. I would argue that Stoicism is not very intrinsic to many men, but even putting that aside, how would you relate Stoicism to biology anyway? What possible biological imperative could make one Stoic, especially when it's mostly in relation to one specific emotion, i.e. crying, an emotion which is unsurprisingly socially considered to be most indicative of women and children? Courage I would question as well. Courage is a very difficult thing to study scientifically, as it requires people to be faced with a threat they believe to be true, which of course raises many ethical problems when talking about study. However, this article I found talks about a study where women were found to be more courageous than men on average. Now, whilst I don't believe one study to be definitive proof, it's certainly more than thought he provided. Strength, I believe, is certainly true, if of course we're talking about physical strength, I don't think anyone would argue with or dispute that. But beyond that one simple definition, there are many ways and in many contexts humans can exhibit strength, so I'm honestly not really sure what thought he is saying here. Resilience is more or less a synonym of strength, so a little redundant in some ways, and given resilience can also mean many things in many contexts, and is arguably even more subjective than strength, trying to claim men have some inherent biological predisposition in all circumstances for this seems absurd to me. Now one could, in my opinion, definitely make a biological argument for assertiveness. I think that one is certainly likely to be true. If hormones and testosterone are related to aggression and competitiveness, then biologically this would make people with more testosterone more likely to be assertive. However, if you wanted to pick a word which best describes the commonality in masculinity in the vast majority of cultures around the world today, and which mostly derives from male biology, 
then the best word would be one that 32 hasn't bothered to include here, and that word would be power. In most societies, men are dominant. Now this is probably a simple result of greater physical strength and a greater tendency towards competitiveness and assertiveness. Those aspects of masculine identity I would very much agree stem from male biology, the tendency to rise up and seize power with greater physical strength and aggression. However, this is where the biological influence mostly ends. The rest of the things Thorty is claiming here, independence, stoicism, courage, resilience, are nothing more than the socially constructed ideals for Western masculinity, and clearly have no established scientific foundation in biology whatsoever. I hope I've already managed to show, without even having looked at his supporting arguments, why the claims Thorty is making here are so wildly inaccurate, misleading and unresearched. But let's look and see how Thorty tries to justify these claims. Long ago, nature's doctrine of survival of the fittest decided that the most efficient way to perpetuate a species through reproduction and ensure its longevity was by dividing each species into two sexes. This division is seen across the entire animal kingdom. What can also be observed in all animal species and humans are the different roles inherent within each sex. With the exception of the male pregnancy witnessed in the Cynephidae family of fish, the young of all species are incubated by the female sex. It therefore makes sense, logistically, that females evolve to have behavioural and physiological traits that are conducive to the healthy development and loving nurture of their young. Empathy, emotional awareness, patience and tenderness. Obviously, it was also vital that the females never put themselves or their young in a situation of danger, so evolution naturally put that onus on the other sex, males. God, it really doesn't take much work to disprove his claims, does it? Female lines never put themselves in danger, do they thought he? Okay, so how many clips of lionesses fighting do I have to show to demonstrate that what Thorty is claiming in this section simply isn't true? If we look at nature, we often see gender roles which are far less rigidly defined than in humans, with males taking an equally active role in nurturing the young, and with females who are just as ready to fight and hunt as the boys. Because once you actually strip away all of 42's rather transparent attempts to look like he knows what he's talking about, witnessed in the Cynephidae family of fish. Yes, Thorty. The Wikipedia page for Seahorse does contain its Latin family name, well googled. But once you strip all that shit out, all he is really saying here is, because all animal species have two sexes like humans do, it's reasonable to assume their gender roles are also the same as humans. An argument literally no more sensible or justified than saying, because all animal species have eyes, it makes sense to assume all animals can read. Beyond that, Thorty once again doesn't provide any research quotes or even examples to really support this sweeping claim. The best he can do is say, it therefore makes sense, and then throw some pictures of kangaroos on the screen. The young of all species are incubated by the female sex. In fact, I really like this bit of the video. I found it very, very funny. The juxtaposition of his commentary with this image is so self-defeating, it's hilarious. Firstly, mammals, such as kangaroos, do not incubate their young. They gestate them. Incubation is for eggs, and gestation is for fetuses. And if you can't even get the vocabulary correct, I have little hope for the actual biology. Secondly, this little kangaroo has already been born. So irrespective of whether it's gestation or incubation, this image does not represent it. Or maybe 32 thinks kangaroo wombs come with sunroofs or something. Thirdly, if we were talking about incubation, then that would be a very bad example, as there are quite a number of bird species where both the male and female take turns incubating and minding the eggs, usually when the other is out looking for food. And lastly, 
Although not true for kangaroos, there are one or two members of the marsupial family where the males also have pouches. But can we just consider Thorty's other list again? The list of female characteristics. Empathy, emotional awareness, patience and tenderness. Empathy, patience, emotional awareness and tenderness. Can I just ask people to think about the proposition that lions and kangaroos are capable of emotional awareness and empathy? These are animals. Emotional awareness, whatever he means by that, and empathy are complex psychological processes and well beyond the scope of the vast majority of animals, well maybe excluding dolphins and some of the higher apes. And how on earth do you measure whether a female lion has more patience or more tenderness than a male lion? If you think about it for a second, you'll see that these are ridiculous statements if you're talking about the science of biology or the behaviour of animals. These are of course social constructs for femininity, that women are the nurturers who take care of their young. But if we actually look at nature, we find many examples of both parents taking an equal role in nurturing their young. Now I am not trying to claim that if you are able to look at all of nature and all species, and could find a method to reliably quantify the nurturing that both males and females provide for their offspring, that you wouldn't still probably find some bias towards females taking a slightly greater responsibility for nurture. But once again, like the biological arguments for masculinity, it is much more generalised and much, much less rigidly defined than Thorty is suggesting here. Males developed a greater aptitude for physical strength and the natural courage to hunt to provide food for their tribe and women. Men evolved to have aggressiveness, resilience and assertiveness, underpinned by undying competitiveness, so they could compete against rival males and protect their tribe from other, scarier tribes who had larger, pointier sticks. So now Thorty has seamlessly transitioned off animals and onto early humans, which should be a clue that none of this is based upon actual science or anthropology. The difference between the social dynamics of a pride of lions and of an early hunter-gatherer tribe is so vast that a lot of recontextualising would be required at this point. But apparently, to Thorty, a pride of lions and an early human tribe is more or less the same thing. But Thorty says here that because men had to hunt to provide food for the women's and had to fight off tribes with pointier sticks, they evolved to be stronger and more courageous. Now I've already mentioned that there is no real proof that men are inherently more courageous than women, but isn't Thorty already somewhat contradicting himself, or at least giving two conflicting explanations for the same thing? He's saying that men evolved these gender traits for these reasons, but previously he stated that gender roles were the same across all species, which suggests that human gender roles were already defined even when we were much more ape-like, so it had nothing to do with the pointy sticks, and you can follow this same logic back through the evolutionary chain. However, the bigger problem is Thorty's claims here seem to once again be based on unresearched assumptions that seem to be contradicted by the actual historical evidence. His belief that tribal humans were highly gender segregated with the men as hunters and women nursing babies in the cave seems not to be supported by research. Studies and research into tribal culture indicate that there is a very real possibility that their small societies were much more egalitarian in structure, with both men and women contributing to all aspects of daily life. There is definitely quite a lot of evidence which suggests women were actively involved in hunting, and even, shock horror, examples of women being buried with spears and weapons bearing the same kind of injuries as the male warriors. So women not only hunted, but also in some cases fought other tribes with their pointy sticks. Now once again for the cheap seats, I am not trying to claim that the sexes are biologically identical or that tribal culture manifests absolute gender equality or is gender blind. Obviously, men and women exhibit biological differences, and obviously those differences can affect societal gender roles. Men are physically stronger and have a greater tendency for aggression, which means that in the majority of cases it will be the men who fight the neighbouring tribes or have to take the most physical roles when hunting. What I am contesting is Thorty's claim that these basic differences inherently and inevitably give rise to the highly complex and segregated gender roles we have evolved in our Western cultures. Because in Thorty's explanation, there is a huge gap in showing how we get from A, these basic biological differences, to B, today's complex societal gender roles.
The truth is that it's hard to know exactly how people structured their social groups 10, 20, 50,000 years ago. Anthropologists, archaeologists and historians are left trying to piece together a picture of ancient societies out of the often few artefacts, images or writings which still remain. Which is why it's also worth remembering that historically many of the people in this field of study have themselves been men, which makes it likely that their readings and interpretations of history were also coloured by their own masculine social perspective and values, which is especially relevant when it comes to filling in the often large gaps left by the lack of concrete historical evidence. And to those snowflakes out there who think everything is an attack on white men, I'm not claiming that this is Western male academics who are intentionally mansplaining or manwashing history, but just that we as humans all tend to see things from our own perspective and contextualise things based on our own experiences and assumptions. However, contrary to everything thought he is claiming, it does seem the further we move away from nature and our tribal ancestors towards a more developed and complexified society, the more our gender roles become increasingly defined, structured and separate. Now it's at this point Thorty abandons his attempts to prove that ideas of Western hegemonic masculinity are not really a social construct at all, but rather an inevitable result of biological and evolutionary imperative, which considering how badly he failed is probably a good thing. So now he is going to move on and explain why his ideas of masculinity are good for society, why men aren't toxic and we shouldn't be emasculating the poor little darlings. Sure, those traits were essential pre-civilization. But why can't we get rid of them today through the systematic emasculation of men? Are they not redundant in the 21st century? Don't such traits cause nothing but toxicity and evil throughout our societies? These are the edicts that many social justice warriors seek to mandate on modern men. Masculinity is a shifting social construct. Its very nature has mutated over the generations. Today, it is more socially acceptable than ever before in the history of humanity for a man to show emotion and share his feelings with his friends, for a man to cry, for a man to choose another man as a sexual partner and marry him. All of these are truly amazing and undeniably positive advances towards a better, more harmonic world, and none of these things degrade a man's masculinity. Okay, so I have to admit, Thorty has been quite slick here and seems to be managing to convey two messages at once. Firstly, he is saying, look everyone, see how far we've evolved. I am not a bigoted reactionary, I am progressive and forward thinking, and I praise these advancements but at the same time seeming to carry the implied subtext, look everyone, we've been more than reasonable, this has gone far enough and anything more is just excessive. But let's think a little more about a couple of the things thought he said in this last section. Masculinity is a shifting social construct. Its very nature has mutated over the generations. If this is true, then why have you spent the last five minutes trying to argue that masculinity is intrinsic to biology and the same across all species? As I've said, it cannot be both. Either it is predominantly a social construct, in which case it can be transitory with no single correct definition or universal model, or it is predominantly intrinsic to biology, in which case it is the same across all cultures and species. When you analyse it, Thorty's video is rife with glaring contradictions like this, but this next one is so indicative of the fundamental problem at the heart of his thinking. Today, it is more socially acceptable than ever before in the history of humanity for a man to show emotion, and none of these things degrade a man's masculinity. OK, so let's try and ignore the fact that Thorty claims it is more socially acceptable for men to show emotion in modern Western culture than ever before in the entire history of humanity. I mean, what a ridiculous statement to make. Even with huge quantities of research, it would be almost impossible to make this claim with 100% certainty, but Thorty seems not to have even done the minimum research to try and give this claim some semblance of credibility. Were the Romans less openly emotional? How about the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Turks, the Druids, the Vikings, the Mongols, the ancient Chinese, the Aborigines, Native Americans? Thorty, this is just a nonsense thing to say. Total and utter fantasy. But it's his contradiction here which bothers me more. 
And none of these things degrade a man's masculinity. Now earlier, Thorty stated very clearly that inherent male biology gave rise to these universal masculine traits, strength, courage, stoicism, independence and assertiveness, which define masculinity around the world. But if a man cries or displays emotion, then clearly he is not being stoic, which by Thorty's own definition can only mean that he is biologically less of a man. He lacks the biological qualities which should be intrinsic to all men everywhere, and therefore he must be less masculine. As I pointed out, Thorty loves complaining about men being emasculated, but Thorty's own definition of masculinity in this video emasculates any man who dares to show emotion or cry. And I really don't know how he fails to see the contradiction here. For a man to choose another man as a sexual partner and marry him. And none of these things degrade a man's masculinity. If this were true, and being homosexual did not degrade one's masculinity, why is the term fag still probably the number one slur used to insult men? Fag, queer, homo, sissy, all of these are common insults. And why? Because homosexuality is not seen as acceptable to masculinity. All of these insults seek to belittle men by suggesting they are less masculine by being homosexual. Yes, we as a society are more accepting and tolerant of homosexuality than we have been in the past, but that does not mean homosexuality has been in any way accepted into our definition of masculinity or what it means to be a real man. And surely thought he is not so blind that he cannot see this for himself. Fag, queer, pussy, cuck, beta, soy boy. Every single one of these terms is an insult specifically because they degrade the target's masculinity. Is he not even aware that the overwhelming majority of reactionary rights insulting rhetoric concerning liberals is emasculating in its intent? Or is emasculation of men only a problem when it happens to conservatives? But anyway, let's keep watching Thorty hang himself with his own arguments. It's getting kind of fun, isn't it? But these are not the traits that authoritarian leftist activists are trying to suppress. What is under fire is the more assertive, domineering and tough side that is biologically present in every man to varying degrees. Such traits and the actions which can be associated with them are too often referred to as toxic masculinity. The issue here is that so-called toxic behaviour is not endemic to masculine men, or even men. Evil and malice are present across all demographic cross-sections of society. There's no denying that men commit crime, and nobody would claim that either sex is perfect. But before shunning masculinity, it's imperative that we understand how dangerous this can be for one simple reason. Masculinity does far more good than bad for everyone, both men and women. And not just a little bit more good. For every bad deed that a man commits in the world, I would propose that well over a thousand good deeds are carried out by other masculine men every day. For every bad deed that occurs in the world, Thorty proposes that a thousand good deeds are carried out by other masculine men. What a fucking ridiculous thing to say when you're supposedly using empirical evidence to make an argument. Thorty just pulls random numbers out of his fat ass because that's simply how great he feels that masculine men are. Thanks Thorty for rendering numbers completely meaningless. Tell me, how are you evaluating this? By what criteria? What are you even classing as a deed? And what constitutes a good deed or a bad deed? Is wolf whistling a woman, one from a building site, a bad deed? What about calling someone a fag or a pussy because he can't drink as much as you? And what's a good deed? Is stepping in to chivalrously defend a woman who is arguing with a man a good deed? Holding a door open? Anti-SJWs love to claim they are all about facts and reason, and it's those authoritarian liberals who base everything on their irrational feelings. So this, this is your idea of a factual empirical argument? Do you have any idea what those words even mean? It's a total fucking embarrassment. Sorry Douglas Adams, but you must be turning in your grave right now.
But anyway, I digress. Let's get back to Thorty and see what these good deeds other masculine men are doing. To live in a society where the majority of good men are publicly shamed for the crimes of the minority of bad men is damaging to the mental health and sense of purpose of men the world over. Especially when this underlying and natural biological trait of the male species are being labelled as the cause of all these evils. It also pulls all the attention away from the many beautiful things that most masculine men achieve every single day, which vastly outnumber the horrendous things a much smaller portion of masculine men do. Do not forget that masculinity was born from a natural desire for men to provide for and protect their family. When a man takes his daughter to school, gives her a kiss and wishes her a good day, that is masculinity doing good. When a man works 10 hours a day to feed, clothe and shelter his family, that is masculinity doing good. When a firefighter rescues a child from a burning building, that is masculinity doing good. When a policeman arrests a perpetrator of domestic abuse, rape or murder, that is masculinity doing good. When a young man shields his sweetheart with his jacket when it rains, that is masculinity doing good. When a surgeon saves a person's life through open heart surgery, that is masculinity doing good. When Alexander Fleming invented penicillin, saving millions of lives, that was masculinity doing good. And when millions of brave men gave their lives to prevent fascism and tyranny from engulfing our world in 1914 and 1939, that was masculinity doing good. So Thorty has given us a lot of reasons why masculinity is good for society. So let's take a look at some of his examples. Thorty cited a father taking his kids to school. This is one of the reasons why being masculine is good for society. So let's go back to Thorty's list of masculine traits. Strength, courage, resilience, stoicism, independence and assertiveness. Which one of these masculine traits is responsible for this good deed? Do you need stoicism to show your kids love? Maybe you need courage to brave the schoolyard. How, Thorty, is masculinity relevant to this in the slightest? This man is displaying tenderness and nurture, traits which you claim are feminine. So this behavior has nothing to do with your own definition of being masculine. You are claiming them as a defense of masculinity just because they are being done by men. Again, masculinity and men are two different things. This could also be done by the most effeminate man that's ever been born. And the man helping his wife in a wheelchair. Once again, where is masculinity inherent in this example? The strength in the arms needed to support this frail old woman, maybe? And how about a scientist? How often a scientist considered the epitome of masculinity? What about science requires stoicism, strength, courage, independence or assertiveness? And what uniquely masculine traits are responsible for hard work? Can less masculine men and women not work hard? And only masculine fire men can save lives, can they? Oh damn, Thorty, wrong again. In his last example, Thorty shows the raising of the flag as an example of when masculinity did good and defeated the evil of fascism. Now bringing up World War II is fascinating, but also kind of stupid. Because whilst defeating fascism was unquestionably a good thing, it can't help but make one think of World War I. World War I was the most deadly and pointless war in the history of the world. It broke out simply because a small group of European leaders and elites got into a colossal dick swinging competition over who was better than who, who was the most important, who was more or less honorable, and who couldn't be trusted. Nobody gained anything, no side was right or wrong, and by the end of it, 20 million people had died. And all because a few kings, czars, prime ministers and generals were too proud and convinced of their own superiority and dominance. World War I can probably be considered a perfect example of how certain aspects of toxic masculinity can be very harmful to the world. And being British, I am a little ashamed that Thorty does not have a more nuanced understanding of wartime gender roles. 
because the truth is the British people as a whole sacrificed hugely in the war against fascism. Men and women both contributed massively to the war effort. During the war, many women stepped up into roles that were traditionally male-oriented, and it's honestly very insulting to the women who lived in that time to suggest the UK's survival from 39 to 44, when the Yanks finally fucking showed up, was uniquely thanks to masculine men. If British women had simply stayed at home and done nothing, we would not have survived. But Thorty seems so concerned with his ideological outrage, he isn't even able to look at one of the most important events in his own country's recent history with objectivity. Thorty, all these deeds you say are the reason masculine men are good for society, have nothing to do with your own definition of masculinity. They could all have been done by completely unmasculine men, or even women. You have failed to provide a single example which shows why masculinity is a positive thing. Even the war where mostly men fought, you failed to acknowledge that it was also men on the other side causing the problems. And remember, according to you, masculinity is a universal trait, so if masculinity is good for defeating fascism, it is also bad for creating it. Anyway, I think I've said enough there, so let's get back to Thorty's nonsense again. The truth is, trying to control a tiny minority of bad men by quashing masculinity in all men is an exercise in futility and idiocy. Bad men will not stop being bad because they become less masculine. They will only become more frustrated, and frustrated people are more likely to commit injustices than content people. The result will be fewer good masculine men to stop the bad men and bad women from being bad. Masculinity and femininity are the two pillars that underpin a cohesive, progressive and productive society that is beneficial to all. Shorten or remove either one of those pillars and society as we know. The society that we've built over thousands of years and the society that we've protected against tyranny and evil will come crashing down beneath our very feet. Masculinity and femininity are the two pillars which underpin a cohesive, progressive and productive society. Now this sounds very poignant, but what does it really mean? Well, whilst thought he was obviously trying to suggest that weakening men would be bad for society, I really don't think he thought through the implications of what he was actually saying. Let's consider masculinity and femininity, two pillars which hold up society. And if we shorten one, then society will come crashing down. Like I said, a very poignant image sortie, a powerful metaphor. So in order to have a stable society, we need to have two pillars, which are of equal size and equal strength to each other. I do agree with that. I think we need a society where women have as much strength and as much power as the men do. Yet. How does modern society thank these everyday, incredible men? They are widely vilified. On social media, in the press, in schools, and in popular culture, and now, even, in advertisements, the historic bastion of greedy capitalism. This has resulted in men committing suicide at three times the rate of women. Seriously, Thorty? Fuck you for this one, man. Fuck you so much. Up until now, I have been trying to be charitable to Thorty. Now that may seem a bit odd as I've taken the piss out of him and trashed his ideas, but what I mean by that is I've been trying to assume that Thorty is arguing in good faith, that although he may be misguided, he genuinely believes what he is saying and that he isn't deliberately and knowingly lying to try and manipulate his audience. But what he says here is just so fucking dishonest and just disgusting and offensive that that charitability is really being stretched to its very limit. Either thought he knows he is just plain lying here, or he simply doesn't give a shit about facts and truth, and is quite happy to say anything, regardless of accuracy, if it supports his ideology. So you heard him quite clearly. He said, Men are widely vilified, and that this has resulted in men committing suicide at three times the rate of women. They are widely vilified. This has resulted in men committing suicide at three times the rate of women. Again, fuck you, Thorty. Okay, first some history. The term toxic masculinity was first coined in the 80s and 90s, 
not by feminists, but by men's self-help associations in the United States. However, the simple truth is the term toxic masculinity has only entered the public discourse over the last five or ten years or so. Prior to that, the overwhelming majority of men had simply never heard the term toxic masculinity. I mean, look at the blockbuster movies from the 80s and 90s. Does this really look like masculine men are being shamed? But concerning Thorty's suicide claim, do men commit suicide at three times the rate of women? They certainly do, and they have been doing so for decades and decades, long before anyone had ever heard of toxic masculinity or before SJWs ever existed. This graph goes back to the 1950s, it shows the suicide rate three times higher consistently. Does Thorty believe that I Love Lucy was shaming masculine men? Or maybe John Wayne and Clint Eastwood were shaming them? It's just so fucking dishonest to stand there and literally claim that authoritarian liberals are directly responsible for men killing themselves just because they are critical of toxic masculinity. When men were committing suicide at higher rates decades before the term toxic masculinity even existed. This is not the only false claim Thorty makes in his video, far from it, but it's probably the most outright demonstrably incorrect thing he says, and the fact he presents it like it's a clear indisputable fact of cause and effect is deplorably dishonest. It just really annoys me when people such as Thorty put themselves on a pedestal and then proceed to present nonsense and lies with authoritative self-importance while simultaneously being shamelessly patronising and condescending to the people they disagree with, being so publicly and confidently wrong about something whilst treating others like naive little children. Now I'm not going to cover the rest of Thorty's video in so much detail. I believe I've already done enough to discredit him completely on this subject, but I just want to give a quick overview so as not, be, so as not to be accused of cherry-picking or ignoring parts of his argument. So after throwing some stats on the screen about how bad things are for men, and like with the suicide, many of these things are, at least partly, a direct result of toxic masculinity, he then goes on to talk a lot about schooling and education. Once again, he makes unfounded claims which he backs up with no proof or studies or articles. He focuses on Swedish gender-neutral schools and makes another horribly dishonest claim when he says that forcing children into these schools causes them problems in later life as they grow up. Now, these schools aren't that common and haven't been in existence for all that long. And I search and it seems literally no research exists into whether these children had problems growing up or were more likely to suffer from relationship problems as adults. One or two studies have been done on their gender attitudes, but nothing on their personal quality of life. Once again, Thorty feels like this kind of schooling will lead to problems, and that's all he needs to state it as an apparent fact in his video. It's so transparent and shameless, I simply do not understand how he can release videos of himself saying things like this and not feel total shame and embarrassment. Right, enough of Thorty. I think we now have enough information to summarise and correct his all too common misunderstanding of toxic masculinity. So how does Thorty misunderstand toxic masculinity? Well, I covered the first part of this earlier in the video, but now we can build upon that to form a more complete and comprehensive picture. So to begin with, as we said before, when Thorty hears the term toxic masculinity, it seems what he is actually hearing is the phrase masculinity is toxic. He understands it like this because he believes, incorrectly as we've seen, that what he thinks of as masculinity comes entirely from male biology. And therefore, if we are saying toxic masculinity, we must be saying men are toxic. Or, maybe more precisely, masculine men are toxic. Now, the addition of this modifier, masculine men, is very interesting. And is actually another example of how Thorty's own choice of words and presentation actually ends up contradicting what he claims to be the facts. Thorty keeps adding the adjective or qualifier masculine men which very strongly suggests he accepts the idea that there exists men who are not masculine. But how does that work when he has already claimed that masculinity is a set of traits universally intrinsic to male biology? 
If that were true, then all men should be masculine by his definition, and therefore adding the masculine adjective is completely unnecessary. And if he does accept that not all men are masculine by his definition, then how can he claim that masculinity is inherent to men's biology, if many men don't have biology that results in his idea of masculinity? And, if he does accept that not all men are masculine by his definition, where does that leave those men? How are those men not being emasculated if we are working from a definition of masculinity which fails to include them? Thorty not only undermines his argument that masculinity is biologically intrinsic to men, but also shows his apparent indignation and resentment over men being emasculated and the harm that that can do to them only applies to those men who fit his incorrect, idealised version of masculinity. He doesn't care about all the men who are emasculated when we adopt his version of masculinity. Just fuck those beta pussies, I guess. So Thorty imagines there is this group of men who are naturally, biologically masculine, and because we say toxic masculinity, or in his mind, masculinity is toxic, we are therefore saying that these masculine men are all toxic and therefore harmful to society. Thorty then reasons, with rather childlike simplicity, that most of these men are in fact good, upstanding members of society, and only a tiny minority are actually bad or evil. So therefore, we are unfairly vilifying and condemning a large number of men for the actions of only a very few. And by extension, we are therefore unfairly maligning and criticising masculinity itself. Because, thoughty reasons, whilst masculinity may cause some masculine men to do bad things, in actual fact in his video he does rather yada yada this point and doesn't go into the details of what bad things masculine men do do, but whilst some masculine men may do bad things, masculinity also causes other masculine men to do all these good things. Now of course we've already seen how most of his examples of masculinity doing good actually had nothing to do with what he defines as masculinity. But beyond that, his understanding of people here is incredibly simplistic. Most of us, I would hope, are smart enough to know that few people are either all good or all bad, and most people in the real world are a bitter mixture of the two. People who do a lot of good can also do bad things, and people who do a lot of bad can also do good things. You know, a cop catches bad people all the day, but can also go home and be physically or emotionally abusive to his family. A fireman could pull people from a burning building during the day, then go to a bar at night and punch someone in the face just for looking at them weird. On top of that, most of us are also smart enough to realise that there are many deeds which are not as serious as either rape or murder, but which can still be harmful, especially if they're done repeatedly. Now I know the term microaggressions can trigger some conservatives and they claim that they are nothing but the fantastical machinations of oversensitive liberal snowflakes. And I am certainly not saying that I unilaterally agree with everything that is considered to be a microaggression. But let me try and convey the same idea with an analogy that I think many more conservatives would be likely to accept as valid. And that is in the old Chinese practice of Ling Chi, or better known as death by a thousand cuts. A simple acknowledgement of the fact that whilst one event may be trivial or insignificant or unimportant, constant repetition of or exposure to the same event again and again and again can, in the end, have significantly harmful effects. So here again thought he is missing or overlooking a vital point. When we talk about toxic masculinity, we're not just concerned about the most extreme outcomes possible, things like rape and violence, but also the seemingly smaller and less significant behaviours, the thousand cuts that toxic masculinity causes men to impose upon themselves and others every single day. But whatever, Thorty doesn't seem to understand or be aware of any of this and he thinks that all masculine men are being unfairly emasculated because of the actions of one or two. He sees people who talk about toxic masculinity as telling all masculine men that being masculine is bad. Thorty seems to think that SJWs and feminists are saying we should be telling masculine men that they shouldn't be these things, that they shouldn't be masculine. But this is just all wrong. So what is toxic masculinity really? 
Well, in order to understand what is meant when we talk about toxic masculinity, we really need to break it down into two component parts. Or, put more simply, in Newtonian terms, its cause and its effect. Now, we are all clear, or at least in part, on the effect because it's what Thorty has spent the last 18 minutes ranting on about. The effect of toxic masculinity is the harm men do to society or to themselves. Now, this is clearly the only part of the issue that Thorty seems to be aware of. For him, it's the whole issue. Thorty thinks that men are naturally masculine, being masculine causes bad acts, and therefore masculinity is bad. And even with this incredibly reductive understanding, he is still managing to be blind to half of the issue. I reiterate, the effect of toxic masculinity is the harm men do to society or to themselves. Thorty doesn't even seem to be aware of the fact that oftentimes this toxic masculinity, which SJWs moan about, is actually harmful to men. It's not just harmful to everybody else, or women, or society, it's harmful to the actual men themselves. But either way, when Thorty hears toxic masculinity, he thinks we're only focusing on the effect, the harm that men do. If we were looking to solve a murder by shooting, Thorty is seeing nothing but the bullet, and sure, it is the bullet which ultimately causes the damage, but if we're looking to find the murderer and the real reason this happens, we want to look at the person who pulled the trigger. We need to look at the cause. When most liberals or feminists or SJWs talk about toxic masculinity, they are focusing on addressing the cause with the intention of hopefully lessening the harmful effects. Again, Thorty seems to think that when people talk about toxic masculinity, they're just complaining about the effects and blaming men for them. That's it, let's complain and blame men. No, it's about actually trying to find solutions to a problem. So what is the cause of toxic masculinity? Thorty thinks it's male biology. Men are just naturally masculine, so naturally like this, so there's nothing to even consider. But I've already demonstrated how his entire concept of nature and biology is completely flawed. So the actual cause of toxic masculinity, and what liberals mean when they talk about toxic masculinity, is the social pressure placed upon all men to conform to a single rigid definition of Western hegemonic masculinity. Thorty sees toxic masculinity as something masculine men do to society. But it's not. It's something society does to all men, masculine or otherwise. Society imposes toxic masculinity on men, and the resulting effect of this social pressure are the behaviours which are in turn harmful to men themselves or back on society. Toxic masculinity is society telling men that if they do not embody a certain specific set of predefined masculine traits, then they are biological failures and that their masculinity is reduced. Telling men that unless they are strong, independent, courageous and assertive, they are not masculine and therefore less worthwhile as men. Yes, Thorty, this video you've made has clearly never raped anyone. It has never been violent, and it has never been abusive. But this video is a perfect example of toxic masculinity. And it's not only masculine men who can perpetrate the effects of toxic masculinity. Any bad deed committed by any man who is motivated by a desire to conform to a masculine ideal is part of toxic masculinity. Men who are by your definition less masculine can sometimes become more toxic in a desire to compensate for their perceived inadequacies. Have you never met a man who is much shorter than the average male, who has a chip on their shoulder? A man who is more aggressive, who gets into more fights than most people? For Christ's sake, short angry man syndrome is so well known as to be a literal trope. See Napoleon, for example. So once again, Thorty believes toxic masculinity is SJWs proclaiming we should be saying to men that you shouldn't be these things strong, assertive, independent, courageous, and so on. When in fact, it's the complete and total opposite. SJWs and feminists are proclaiming we shouldn't be saying to men that you should be these things.
It has nothing to do with pressuring men not to be certain things, but rather not pressuring them at all, leaving men the freedom to be as traditionally masculine or not as they wish, and not stigmatising those who aren't. So nobody is saying that men shouldn't be traditionally masculine, but rather that we shouldn't be pressuring them to be traditionally masculine, or making them feel inadequate or like lesser men if they don't happen to fit a traditional rigid definition of Western masculinity. As Thorty perfectly demonstrated, what our society considers to be masculine traits mostly involves strength, independence, stoicism, dominance, etc. And sadly, that means many men do often feel inadequate in their masculinity, and then they seek to compensate. Their subsequent actions very often end up affecting, and sometimes harming, themselves or other people, which is why we call this toxic. How often are men confrontational, violent, aggressive or abusive just because they feel their masculinity has been challenged and they need to prove something? Jesus, it's a cliché as old as time. Even men who are genuinely very masculine in the traditional sense can manifest toxic and harmful behaviour if they feel their masculinity is called into question. Let the men who fit traditional masculine ideals be masculine in that way, and let men who don't fit traditional masculine ideals also be masculine, and don't suggest that either is a more or less valid version of masculinity, and don't suggest that either makes them more or less of a man than the other. If you go around telling men their biology means they should be independent, courageous and so on, then you are also telling them that any man who isn't those things is biologically less of a man. And whether it's justified or not, any man who feels inadequate in their masculinity could potentially end up engaging in unnecessary toxic behaviour in order to compensate. Now as I know there are certain people out there who like to take reasonable arguments and exaggerate or strawman them to a ridiculous degree with the intention of discrediting them with accusations of absurdity, I'd just like to clarify at this point that neither I nor anybody else is suggesting that we completely stop giving males role models or that we abdicate any responsibility in trying to teach them values and virtue. There are many values we can instill in our children which do not revolve around invoking traditional ideas of Western masculinity. Honesty, trust, kindness, humility, charity, self-sacrifice, you know, all the stuff that comes from the Bible for starters. Most of that isn't concerned with masculine dominance. We can still give our kids many things to aspire to without needing to push a limited definition of biological masculinity as one of those things, and certainly without making them feel they are less valuable in society or somehow biological failures if they do not perfectly embody a certain limited set of traits. Let's consider for a moment the actual biological reality underpinning our ideas of traditional masculinity. This thing here is something that I am a big fan of, and it's called the bell curve of standard distribution, or deviation. Now this is not to be confused with a somewhat controversial book of the same name, The Bell Curve, which ironically, just like Thorty, is a book that simply appropriated the name of something reputable and credible to try and leech off the credibility that comes with the name, without actually earning that credibility for themselves. Now the actual bell curve of standard distribution is nothing more than a graph which predicts how a random trait or characteristic will be distributed throughout a population. Along the x-axis at the bottom you have whatever trait we're talking about, and the y-axis shows the percentage of the population who possess that trait. The area below the line will always add up to 100% of the population. The most basic example of this would be people's heights. Along the x-axis you would have the height, from the world's smallest person on the far left to the world's tallest person on the far right. And then, again on the y-axis, it would show the number of people who have that height. Obviously, the majority of people fall towards the middle, the middle line itself being the average of the population. As you move away from the centre line towards increasingly taller or shorter people, you will find less and less specimens. Normally, any randomly distributed trait will follow this pattern. IQ tests, for example, are calibrated so that results of the tests fit this curve, 
as it is assumed that intelligence is a randomly distributed trait. Wealth, however, would not fit the bell curve, because wealth is not randomly distributed throughout the population. So let's take our bell curve and say that the population we are representing on the y-axis is the population of men. And along the x-axis, we are quantifying the trait of traditional masculinity. Now at present, there is obviously no way to actually objectively quantify a person's amount of masculinity, but then it wasn't possible to quantify intelligence before someone devised the parameters and tests to do it either. However, like intelligence, it's still perfectly reasonable to assume that a person's tendency to embody certain traditional masculine traits is randomly distributed, just like any other characteristic. So on the left, we would have the most non-masculine man we can find, and on the right, we would have the most manly man who has ever manned. Now, let's say for argument's sake that Thorty's definition of masculinity accurately describes a man who falls exactly in the middle of this curve, the perfectly average male. Immediately, you have the problem that you have an entire 50% of the male population which is failing to live up to the masculine standard. They are being emasculated and made to feel inadequate by not being masculine enough to meet the social average. And that's assuming the ideal we push for masculinity does fall dead in the centre here. However, I would argue that if we're honest, the ideal thought he sets for masculinity describes a man who is considerably more masculine than this average male. To illustrate this point, let's have some fun and pick some examples and see where we think they would fall on this masculine scale. And let's start with Thorty himself. Where would Thorty fall on this scale? Well, as we've noted, he has quite smooth fair skin with very little stubble. If you look at his physique, he is more tubby and a little bit podgy than muscular. He seems to have relatively small hands. And although it's entirely subjective on my part, I will admit, I don't really see him as the kind of person who would be the first to dive in and break up a violent bloody fight outside a nightclub. To me, he appears to be decidedly average, and probably skewing a little bit to the left of the average masculinity line. So let's place him, say, about here. Now what about this lovely specimen? Once again, he is a little overweight and podgy, certainly not the muscular athletic type, quite mildly spoken and doesn't seem that assertive in discussions. At least he is capable of growing a beard though, which helps. Once again, I don't really see him as the kind of person who would rush in to get involved in a physical confrontation, so let's place him right in the middle. Sargon strikes me as a very typically average male. So what about this guy? Well, Paul is certainly a little more masculinely handsome in his looks, and he doesn't have the flab of the other two, he seems a bit more athletic. However, he is quite severely let down by being smaller and more spindly. Maybe, I don't know, I was going to say he's just creeping over the line to the right a tiny bit? So okay, yeah, go on, let's place Paul around about here, just a tiny bit over the average male. And so what about this guy then? Well, certainly PewDiePie is more masculine than the last three examples, rather blowing them out the water. He's taller, he's better looking, he's in better physical shape. Having said that, I still doubt he's much of a fighter, and I doubt he gets involved in many physical confrontations. But PewDiePie can definitely go higher on the scale than the other three, certainly a little bit over the average. My point is, most of these guys are fairly average masculine men. And do these men look like the kind of ideal that Thorty is promoting when he talks about Western masculinity? I would say not, and this is certainly reflected by some of the men he shows in his video. I would say our actual ideal for what a man should be is closer to this than this. And where does Tyler fall on the bell curve? Well, probably up here somewhere which means that every day a huge percentage of the male population fails to live up to what society tells them the ideal masculine man should be. Even Tyler himself says this openly. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. I look like you want to look, I fuck like you want to fuck, I am smart, capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. And it's that feeling of not being good enough as a man, and the constant need or desire to prove oneself, which lies at the heart of toxic masculinity.
By pushing this one rigid idea of what a man should be, we condemn many men to feeling inadequate and emasculated, and with a constant need to prove themselves. Thorty believes he is defending men and standing up for their interests, but he's not, he's condemning them. His video is an integral part of the harmful culture of toxic masculinity, telling men that if they are not strong, assertive, independent and stoic, they are not masculine men and therefore biological failures. So basically that's all. As I said, this video ended up being much, much longer than I expected. By the time I realised how long it was going to be, I really wasn't sure how to edit it down and keep continuity. I've already cut quite a lot out. Damn, it's hard writing and pacing a longer video. I still have a lot to learn. But anyway, to sum up, Thorty's video is, in short, complete bullshit. He basically lies about what toxic masculinity is telling his audience it's feminist SJW saying that being masculine is bad, which it isn't. And then he lies about biology and anthropology to refute the lie he told about toxic masculinity and show that why masculinity is actually good. It's hard to know to what extent he knows he's lying. It could be that he's never tried to understand the subject and just jumped to conclusions. It could also be that he's simply lying to his audience to get them mad and riled up at liberals. Either way, the result is the same. The information he shares is incorrect and misleading. His biological argument is all over the place. He says masculinity is a social construct, and then argues that all of the most important traits of masculine identity are actually firmly rooted in biology. He argues that the strictly defined gender roles we have in modern societies can be traced back through all of human civilization, and then also back through the evolutionary chain, and remain the same throughout. When actually, all the evidence suggests that as we move back through civilization and out into the animal kingdom, gender roles become less and less rigidly defined, with more and more commonality and more and more overlap. Now, of course, men and women are not biologically identical in all respects. Nobody thinks that. And there certainly is, on some level, a connection between our biological differences and some of the social roles we assume. Men, for example, are more likely to fight because they tend to be physically stronger and more aggressive, as well as being biologically capable of fathering more offspring. However, suggesting that modern desirable masculine traits like independence and stoicism are in any way connected to biology is ridiculous. Actually, I think the bell curve provides an interesting way to think about sexual dimorphism. Imagine we were to say that, on average, men have a higher capacity than women when it comes to 3D spatial reasoning and visualization. I believe that's a true statement. But anyway, now let's imagine that we calculate the 3D reasoning ability of all men and plot it onto a graph. We would still get a bell curve with men with very high ability on the right and men with low ability on the left. Now let's do the same for women. And now that we have these two different bell curves, let's overlap the graphs one on top of the other. Now, as men have a higher average ability, their middle line will be to the right of the women's. But what's important to note here is that despite the average being higher for men, there is still a huge area of overlap where you have women who are as capable or more capable than many of the men. Whenever you're thinking about gender roles and differences between the sexes, it's always useful to think of it in this way, and remember there are big variations of any characteristic within each sex, often bigger than between the sexes. As for the subject of toxic masculinity, Thorty says that people who talk about it are saying that masculinity is bad, and that they are trying to emasculate masculine men by denying them the right to their masculinity and taking it away from them. They're not. They're saying that men, all men, are put under enormous social pressure to live up to and embody a very specific masculine ideal, of such a high and rigid standard that it leaves many men feeling inadequate, and the subsequent desire to prove or affirm their masculinity can often result in behaviour which is harmful to them or others. This whole process is toxic, making men feel inadequate and pushing them into stupid, unnecessary, harmful behaviours to prove themselves. Although Thorty's claims that men evolved biologically to embody typical Western masculine traits are mostly nonsense, I am inclined to believe that wherever a man ends up on the traditional masculinity bell curve is still probably in large part due to biology and biological chance. <laughs>
The point is, I don't believe we'll see a sudden massive decline in traditionally masculine men simply because we stop putting pressure on them to embody traditional masculine values. People usually tend to end up following their own nature, and all we'll probably see is a reduction in men who are faking it, men who aren't naturally all that traditionally masculine, but who've convinced themselves they are or that they should be. MRAs. Toxic masculinity hurts men. Men commit suicide at three times the rate of women because they believe they are supposed to be strong, independent and stoic, so when they have problems or traumas in their lives they are far less likely to ask for help or talk about it. They try to deal with things alone until it gets too much, they can't cope anymore and go too far. I don't expect you to change all your political ideas, but understanding this one thing is important. I'm not asking you to agree with everything feminists say about every subject, geez I certainly don't, but that doesn't mean they are wrong about everything either. So on this one thing I ask you to let go of your anger and your pride and try and see that maybe they have a point. Oh and one last thing, in today's world it is always possible to find some idiot or a student somewhere on Twitter or YouTube expressing an idea in a stupid, reductive, ignorant or misleading way. Any perspective, any subject, there'll always be someone saying something dumb about it. But claiming an idea is dumb simply because one person expressed it dumbly is in itself extremely dumb. Never assume the words of one or two people will accurately reflect the beliefs of many. And with that I'll finally bring this ridiculous marathon of a video to an end. If you are a fan of Thoughties or agree with his take on the subject, then thank you for staying until the end. I know if you feel politically opposed to people, then the instinct is to reject outright everything they say. But the simple truth is that nobody is ever absolutely 100% right about everything, and almost nobody is always 100% wrong about things either. We are living in very dark, divided times, but maybe we're not always as divided as we think. And maybe there are those who benefit from pretending we're more divided than we are, and who sow seeds to encourage that division. <laughs>